Hi, I'm Heather Marie Montilla, and you are watching PBS Books. Tonight's Saving American Journalism, The Information Needs of a Democracy, features a conversation between the Texas Tribune CEO and co-founder, Evan Smith, and the 19th editor-at-large, Aaron Haynes. Thank you for joining us. An informed citizen is essential to our democracy, but how? Does someone in 2022 get that information? Newsroom jobs have shrunk by 26% over the last decade. Today, newsrooms are still not reflective of our population. Racial and ethnic minorities still only comprise about 17% of print and online newsroom staffs. More than half of all Americans say they do not trust mainstream media. Meanwhile, 73% of Americans report that the spread of inaccurate information through fake news on the internet was a major problem. And about 90% of millennials and Gen Z are getting their news from social media. In many ways, these facts just create more questions, which are especially important for libraries, which are one of the most trusted institutions of our democracy because they help citizens gain and navigate information. That's why PBS Books is thrilled to host this conversation this evening. As many of you know, we partner with libraries and PBS stations across the country to bring important content to you. We're excited to share tonight's conversation to spark dialogue and encourage you to think about journalism, information, and its future in the digital age. To kick off tonight's conversation, I am pleased to welcome Rich Homburg, President and CEO of Detroit Public Television. Welcome, Rich. Thank you, Heather. Uh, tonight's topic is journalism, and tonight you'll hear from two leaders in the field, both of whom are building and innovating new approaches to bringing news and information to larger and more diverse audiences. I know you'll find what they have to say provocative as they discuss the challenges facing journalists and also some reasons for hope in journalism future. This is exactly the kind of conversations we at PBS Books are trying to foster for people across the country, working with your local stations, with libraries and other venues and partners across the country. Our two great journalists will be introduced by David Boardman, Dean of the College of Media and Communications at Temple University. As a proud alum of Temple, I'm fortunate to have, to have gotten to know David as I've watched him build the Klein School into one of the best schools of its kind in the country. It's a great time to be a Temple owl. His background is in journalism. David served as the executive editor and senior vice president of the Seattle Times, where the organization won four Pulitzer Prizes under his leadership. Personally, he's won many, many awards, far too many to go into here. You can look it up. But what's particularly of interest this evening is the role he is playing as a driving force in expanding diversity in newsroom and inventing new sustainable ways to support local journalism. He's the chair of the Lenfest Institute for Journalism, the nonprofit that owns the Philadelphia Inquirer. He chairs the nonprofit news site, The Markup, which is focused on the nexus of technology and industry. He's worked on the boards of ProPublica, Solutions Journalism, the Reporters Committee for Freedom of the Press, and many others. David is striving to build a brighter future for journalism. We all share common objectives, and we want to take you down the road tonight of understanding the future of journalism. And with that, David's going to give us a little deeper look at our two guests. Have a great evening. Thank you. Thank you, Rich. And certainly your alma mater is very proud of you. A good evening, welcome to what will surely be a robust conversation on a topic near and dear to my heart and I know to many of yours. We're calling it Saving American Journalism, but it really could just as well be called Saving American Democracy. For as our nation's founders recognized, a robust and free press is essential to the functioning of a democratic republic. Conversely, the dysfunction of our democracy in recent years is undoubtedly tied to the dramatic decline of the news industry, and particularly on a local level. As Heather referred to, over the past 15 years or so, the number of people working as journalists in America has plummeted by a quarter at an average loss of about 1,000 jobs a year. 
One in every four local newspapers in the country is shut down and hundreds of communities no longer have a regular reliable source of local news. With that decline, academic studies have shown comes a decrease in voting and other civic participation and an increase in corruption and political division. Misinformation abounds and trust in news is at an all time low. With as a, as a former newspaper editor myself, I can personally attest that it's been bleak. However, and this is a very big however, while it's the most challenging time in the history of the news business, it's also in many ways the most exciting. Innovative people are changing the way news is defined, the way it's covered, the way it's delivered, and the way it's paid for. They're raising profound and overdue questions about who covers the news and for whom it is covered. Tonight, we're fortunate to have in conversation two of those 21st century news pioneers. Evan Smith is the CEO and co-founder of the Texas Tribune, the groundbreaking nonprofit digital news organization. When Evan started the Tribune in 2009, a site that would cover Texas politics and public policy, paid for by donations and events, nothing quite like it existed. Today, it is a thriving and respected journalistic enterprise and a model for hundreds of new news organizations across the country. When Evan announced last month that he'd be stepping down, the accolades flooded in. As the Washington Post media writer Margaret Sullivan put it, if local journalism does survive in this country, Evan Smith will deserve a big share of the credit. PBS viewers might recognize Evan as the host of Overheard with Evan Smith, a weekly interview program that airs on PBS stations across the country. Welcome, Evan. In conversation with Evan will be another innovative journalist and leader, Aaron Haynes. Aaron is the co-founder and editor of, at large of The 19th, a digital news site focused on the nexus of women and politics. She previously worked at the Los Angeles Times, the Washington Post and the Associated Press. Aaron is also my colleague on the board of the Lenfest Institute for Journalism, which owns the Philadelphia Inquirer. You'll likely recognize her as well as she regularly appears on MSNBC. Welcome to you, Aaron. I'm excited to hear these wonderful, brilliant people talk about the future of news. And you online viewers will have a chance to engage with them by placing your questions in the chat function on your screen. Those questions will be addressed at the end of their conversation. Thank you all and kicking back to you, Aaron. Thank you so much, David. And listen, thanks to you. I'll just take a point of personal privilege here uh, to thank you for your leadership as the founding board chairman of the Linfest Institute for Journalism. Uh, you passed that baton on today and I got to come on as a board member in your final year. And it has just been so amazing to work together with you to support and strengthen local journalism. Uh, Heather, thanks to you. Thank you so much to PBS Books and, and really I uh, am glad to be here in a moment where libraries are also part of, of the conversation about our discourse uh, and our democracy. So I, I feel like this is exactly the platform for us to be having this conversation about where, uh, who and where we are as a democracy and where we go from here. Uh, but I'm excited for this conversation with somebody else that I got to know on his way out. Uh, wait, yeah. does that mean that I'm like some sort of jinx or something? I'm not sure. sure. But uh, as my boss's former boss, who has generously invited me to participate in the Texas Tribune Festival, uh, for the past couple of years, including last year when he interviewed me. So I am honored to return the favor tonight. So let's get started. Hello, short timer. Hello, groundbreaker. Hello, old friend and journalism hero. It's great to be with you. Oh, thank you so much. Well, look, let's just get right into it because I know we want to get to a lot. And we want to certainly leave some question, time for questions from uh, the audience uh, to, to ask whatever they want to know about your imminent departure. Uh, you know, well, first of all, how imminent is it? Just making sure we're not breaking any news tonight. David's last day was today as Linfest board chair. Is it your last day? Uh, uh, it it, it yeah. is not. It is not. I have a lot of work to do, and I'm going to work every day, long hours, to benefit the people of Texas and to do the amazing public service work that we've done now for going on 13 years. I'm going to be in this job probably till October, November. A national search is about to begin for my successor. I'll stick around, work as CEO until that person is here. And then when that person arrives, I'll pass the baton. And I'll stay as a senior advisor to that person for about another year, give that person a, a good period of time to transition in, raise some money, take that person around the state of Texas. You know, it's a big state. There are a lot of people to meet. 
Um, I love the Texas Tribune, Aaron, as much in the 13th year as I did on the first day. Yeah. Uh, this is a great organization and the need for the kind of work that we do and others around the country are doing similar to what we do, never more important than now. So I am all in until my very last day. Well, glad we got that out of the way. Uh, so let's go back to your first day. I mean, you took yeah. the helm at the Texas Tribune the same year Barack Obama became our country's first president. Uh, right. Just a few years after Twitter and Facebook were born, TikTok and Snapchat didn't even exist yet. Uh, right. And there was no such thing as fake news or the big lie. So, I mean, I want to start by asking you what you would say has been the biggest change in journalism during your tenure. And what yeah. would you say has been the biggest game changer? Well, there are probably a number of things I could cite. I'll look back to something that we heard earlier in the introduction of this conversation, and that is the distrust that we now accept as the norm in media. I would say probably 13 years ago, when I came to work every day, the, the default setting was that people trusted the press. Today, the default setting is people don't trust the press. I don't like it, but I don't mind it because it's important to know when you come to work every day, the size of the mountain you have to scale. And that's a huge mountain to scale. You know, people assume going in the door that you're doing work that is either dishonest or incorrect, that you have bad motives. My view is we have an obligation to prove every single day that we're worth trusting. I don't take for granted the fact that the public's going to trust us. And we're in a state where politically there's probably a little bit more distrust than in some other states of the media. So we go out of the gate every day thinking fair, thorough, accurate, listen to everybody, talk to everybody, try to understand where everybody's coming from, do the very best job that you can, don't tell people what to think, do tell people to think. Remind them of why paying attention to what's happening in politics and public policy is important, how it contributes to a properly functioning democracy, um, how we help them become more thoughtful, productive, and engaged citizens. To me, the trust question, Aaron, is the thing that has really pivoted the most of all the many things that's changed in the last 13 years. Yeah, I mean, I, I tend to agree with you. Uh, I, I, and I wonder if you think that part of that trust, uh, certainly at the 19th, one thing that we have been so humbled and affirmed by is that, uh, you know, one way that people show their trust in what we do every day is, is by supporting us as members. Uh, right. And I wonder what you think about that model uh, as a way to reinforce that trust. I think a lot of our audience are speaking with their pocketbooks in terms of the journalism that they are willing to support. Uh, do you think that that's an important show of trust? And do you think that that is a model that really allows them to create the kind of community that can better foster trust between the public and our profession? Well, I don't take for granted that anybody is going to support us financially. We make everything that we produce available for free. The theory is that a public service mission can't be accomplished behind a paywall. If the goal is that you're trying to get as many people who are without information in front of really good, reliable, credible information, and then the first thing you do is erect a barrier between them and you, you're doing it wrong. So we're very committed to the idea that all this stuff should be free. But when people decide to give us 10 bucks or 30 bucks or 50 bucks or more, it does definitely mean that they're with us and that they, they support the work we do and that they're validating the importance of the work that we do. Budgets are moral documents. That's the old cliche, right? How you spend your money tells us something about your values. And when people spend their money with us, it tells us how much they value the work that we produce. Now, you know, the people who read us for free are still important to us. Our goal is reach. Our goal is to get as many people into this conversation as possible. What yeah. we're not about, what you're not about at the 19th is reselling eyeballs to advertisers. Having upset the setup of the economics of this business, we can just focus our efforts entirely on mission and public service. And so to, to, me, to me, that's really the thing that we do every single day. And when people spend money with us, heck yes, it's a great validation of our best efforts. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I, I mean, I cannot say enough how urgent the public service component of what it yep. is we do feels uh, in this moment. And so uh, right. thank you for uh, blazing the trail and 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 reinforcing the, the, the importance of that and showing why it matters and that, frankly, it can be successful. Yeah. Uh, so I, 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 your farewell letter uh, that, that you wrote last month, uh, you said in that letter that it's time for you to step down. Right. Talk to me about why now. Well, look, there's never an easy, uh, 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 it's never easy to leave a place you love. There, you know, it's, it's, there's never a good time, right? But there's a right time. Um, to me, this organization had to be in a place financially. It had to be in a place journalistically. We had to be achieving our goals or exceeding them on audience and membership. All the ways in which we measure our success and impact, all of those numbers had to be in the right place for me to feel comfortable handing this thing off to somebody else. It's, it's one thing to be the CEO. It's another thing to be the co-founder. 
Yeah. But I think when you're the co-founder, you think of this organization almost like your kid. I've got two kids, 25 Absolutely. and 21. This, this is my third kid. Some days it's my best behaved kid. Some days it's my worst behaved kid. Um, but I feel the way I do about a kid, about the Tribune, and I would not just walk away one day and not come back without feeling like my kid, this place, is in a good place. This organization, the Text Tribune, has now passed $100 million raised to pay for serious journalism. Audience is the biggest it's ever been, the most members we've ever had. Our journalism is the best it's ever been. We have the right leaders of our organization, including our amazing editor-in-chief, Sewell Chan, who came from the Los Angeles Times in place. So it may not be an easy time to leave, but it's the right time for the organization. And to be honest, I've, I've had two jobs in 30 years with a weekend between them. And I've run places for much of that time. I think it's a good time for me to let somebody else take a swing at running it. And honestly, Aaron, also, we've talked about this offline. It'd be good for us to give somebody a chance to run this place who doesn't look like me. Yeah. There is a new generation of people in a state like Texas that is as diverse as this state is. Let's give somebody who looks like this state, who comes from this generation, who reflects the stories and the experiences and the values of the audience we serve and the material we cover a chance to run this news organization. I know you and I both believe in equity and representation in newsrooms as a priority. It's time to talk the talk and walk the walk. And so I'm happy to step aside and give somebody else a chance. Well, you know, you could not have teed me up better. And just just to put a, a, a finer point on that, I mean, it, it certainly sounds like you have feelings on whether your successor should be a person of color. I, I mean, just continue to make the case for why yeah. that is important to you and and uh, and what you think about the potential for that to happen. I think we've certainly seen at the 19th, there's an embarrassment of riches in terms of qualified, capable, right. talented people who are ready to lead this country's newsrooms. And so the excuse that people can't find those folks anymore is it's just it's just it it, it really is falling on increasingly deaf ears. Well, my, my response is look harder uh, to, to that. But 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 I, look, I'll say this. The, the best practice for any organization where the CEO is departing is that the CEO is not involved in the search for his or her successor. So I will have nothing to do with the search for my successor. But I certainly have a point of view about this. Yes. And I don't mind sh sharing it. And that is that I am in a state that has a fast growing and dynamically changing population. This year, according to the U.S. Census, the white population and the Latino population of Texas are about the same. Historically, the white population has been either a plurality or a majority. And now the white population is below 40% for the first time. So people of color in Texas represent now 60% of the population of the state for the first time. This year, the Hispanic population will pass the white population for the first time ever. The white population will continue to be a smaller percentage of the population of Texas. We are a minority majority state, and we will soon be a, minor, a majority Hispanic state. I think that if you're going to do the best possible job from a journalism standpoint of telling the stories of a state as diverse as this one, where the communities are fast growing uh, and, and dynamically changing, and, this, and, and a state that is also, by the way, becoming much more urban. We have five of the 12 largest cities in the state, in the country by population, more than any other state. I kind of think we ought to think about what the future of this state, hell, what the present of this state looks like. The best newsroom is going to be one that is reflective of the diversity of the state you're covering and the audience you're serving. So I've certainly encouraged the people who are involved with this search, our board, the firm that is leading our efforts, to be as, as, uh, as, as open-minded to the idea that the person who comes in behind me will look nothing at all like me and that it might be very good for our journalism and good for our state. So I'm, I've got my fingers crossed. Um, and I just say again, look harder. If you can't find that person, look harder. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it certainly sounds like you've learned a lot in your tenure, particularly around issues of equity and power sharing. I mean, was that something that you always considered from the beginning or was that something that you had to learn and, and, and a way in which you evolved as, as a leader? It, it, I, I can tell that it's something that you really feel like uh, is an essential priority for your successor to be thinking about issues of equity. Right. Um, I, I'll be honest with you. I have evolved over these 13 years because I think over the 13 years that I've run the Tribune, the importance of prioritizing equity representation as a through line in everything we do, um, it, it's just become clearer and clearer to me. Um, and, and look, I think our industry has been behind. I know I don't have to sell that idea to you. You're, you're definitely somebody who believes that. I believe that. We haven't done a good enough job of matching our good intentions with our actions. And so I just want us over time to be better at this. 
I learn every day about the needs of our industry as it relates to this subject. And I want to be a good actor and I want to be somebody who, who matches his values with his actions. And so um, I, I believe that the Texas Tribune has a lot to, uh, to, uh, to learn from other organizations. The 19th has been in its first couple of years in business, a model for us to, uh, to emulate. I think we're doing better than some organizations on, on this front, but I think we still have a lot of work to do and we're committed to doing it. Yeah, well, I mean, look, Evan, even the way that you are talking, frankly, there are not a lot of founders like you uh, who may be white and or male who are talking uh, the talk that you were talking here. And I want to ask you about that because you yeah. mentioned in your farewell yeah. letter, again, yeah. you brought up uh, founder's disease, which I think is a cousin of anyone uh, who has been a veteran in any institution. Right. Um, start by talking about like what you mean by founder's disease. Like, what is it? How is it harmful to organizations that need to evolve? And also just in terms of, of these issues of gender politics and policy that we reckon with, but also central to that is, is that coverage is the notion of power. Um, yeah. Part of why we started the 19th is because we felt like political journalism was too white and too male. Uh, and the existing newsrooms weren't doing enough, uh, quickly enough to really change the yeah. status quo. So, um, I mean, founder's disease, how does that hold people back from helping with that process? How and when did you realize that you had it? Well, it's been a couple of years that I've been thinking that I was too sentimental and too nostalgic for the first days of the Tribune. I think anybody who starts any business, not just a journalism business, but any business knows what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. you, you know, you're captive to the origin story. You, yeah. you, you love to tell people about back in the old days when we first started this place or before we started this place. This is how we did things. The problem, I think, with this founder, I don't want to necessarily paint every founder with the same brush, but the problem with this founder is that at some point that sentimentality and nostalgia gets in the way of change and progress and evolution. And every organization needs to change. It's like that old joke about, you know, uh, sharks die if they don't move forward. What we have on our hands is a dead shark, right? I don't want this to be a dead shark organization. I want us to always change and always grow and always evolve and always uh, progress. And, you know, I have advertised myself internally and externally as a big agent of change, but I also understand that my being wedded to the way we used to do things around here is probably not helping us be as ambitious and bold in our agenda for change as we could be. And so rather than stick around longer than is useful, I decided, you know, take a victory lap and, 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 and hand the baton to somebody else. Aaron, you and I have both known people. We've both known people who were in jobs too long and didn't know it. Worse, we've both known people who were in jobs too long and did know it and stayed anyway. I just don't want to be that person. And I don't think it's good for this organization to have somebody who has outlived his ability to propel the place forward and to give opportunity to everybody here to make this an even better Texas Tribune than it's been. So I'm, I'm at peace with that. Yeah. Um, I, I am not going to succumb to founder's disease. I'm going to gracefully, elegantly exit at the right moment. Well, thank you for warning me of the signs. I'll be sure to keep an eye out for that. Keep We're eye out years it, right. old, so I probably got a ways to go before founders yeah. starts creeping in. But, um, but, yeah. but I think that's I think that's an important an important message. And look, there's something to be said for going out on a high note. Uh, if not for uh, you personally, uh, you know, especially uh, if not for you know democracy and 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 the state of of our profession right now. So right. let let's transition into that because I want to yeah. ask you really. Just kind of how you how do you see journalism's relationship to democracy as we sit here today? Uh, they're one and the same. I've been talking about democracy as the reason we're in business going back to 2009, 2010. Believe me, I'd take the democracy we had then over the democracy we have now. Mm -hmm. Back then, I talked about how democracy was, uh, you know, hinged on our success doing this work. Today, democracy is hanging by a thread. Yeah. It literally is the difference, I think, between a properly functioning democracy and one that can't function at all. We have an extraordinary number of low information and no information citizens in the state of Texas. No different from a lot of other places, although I will note that the Washington Post several weeks ago reported that 60 percent, 60 percent of the counties in Texas have one newspaper or no newspapers. Mm -hmm. It is news desert after news desert after news desert when you go east to west, north to south. Um, the people who don't have adequate information about the fights being waged in their names at our state capitol or the stakes they have in the outcomes of those fights. The people who don't know when an election is coming up, like the one we have, we have primary on March 1st, we have our general election in November, who's on the ballot? Who represents me? Basic stuff people don't actually have access to because they're lacking a reliable, credible source of information in their communities. 
Uh, I mean, to me, that's why you end up with conspiracy theories uh, running uh, rampant around our states and around our country. It's why you have misinformation and disinformation that goes largely unchecked and unchallenged. Um, we are in the business of providing people with facts. We search for the truth and we tell people what we find, what they do with those facts, what they do with that truth is up to them. And I realize that today in a lot of places, Aaron, there's not one set of facts Yeah. and there's not one truth. That's something we have to combat. But it begins with us providing that reliable, credible source of information. Over the last couple of years in Texas, we had the same pandemic that everybody else had. It was particularly pernicious here. We also had this horrible winter storm almost to the day one year ago as I sit here. During both of those deals, the pandemic and the winter storm, the amount of misinformation and disinformation targeting in particular communities of color that were without reliable sources of information it was just awful. And, and so having a, a place like the Texas Tribune to tell people basic information, basic facts, was literally the difference between life and death. Our democracy relies on reliable, credible news organizations doing their public service work. So I think that you asked about what the relationship is. They are one in the same. They are yeah. one in the same. Yeah, and I think that probably was, was the lesson of the pandemic. I mean, what a lifeline journalism, yep. especially local journalism, was to so many communities. And right. just the ability of local journalism to, just as you said, give people a shared set of facts. Uh, your 10-year parallels, uh, you know, what was alluded to at the top of this conversation, uh, just the, the complete erosion of local journalism uh, across this country. And and yes, what we have seen crop up uh, in in the absence of, of local journalism uh, right. is something that has been uh, very damaging to our democracy, but also has really um, you know, uh, raise the the size of the mountain uh, to to borrow your your yeah. uh, allegory about uh, that that we have to climb every single day. Uh, something we were talking about a little earlier uh, that I I want you to kind of share with the group. Uh, I know the answer to this, but they don't, so I'll just ask it again, and you can yeah. talk about it. Um, do you think covering politics has gotten easier or harder over your tenure? Oh, I think it's gotten much harder. I think it's uh, politics and politicians have gotten uglier and meaner in the last 13 years. And I think we've seen the disappearance of the center in politics. Uh, that's not a new idea, but it's pushed everybody and everything to the outer edges. And um, it's made it difficult to have conversations with people who show up at the table, presuming, as I said earlier, that the press is not to be trusted, is all fake news and, and what have you. And, you know, you'd be surprised. You think that that's all on one side politically. There are actually people on both sides of this who take issue with the press. I mean, we were joking earlier about a particular national reporter at a particular national publication who is now being attacked actually from the left. Um, we have media attacked from the left and the right. Yeah. Uh, on, on this day that we sit here for reporting that this individual did. I mean, and, and I just think it's gotten to be harder to get people to understand that um, we're just trying to do our jobs. We're just trying to ferret out what is true and what is not true. We're trying to get information that we and that their constituents, that the public, that the country is entitled to. Um, and yet there are more barriers erected than ever between us and that information. You know, the whole question of getting access to public information, public records, any hurdle that can be erected between us and that information which we are entitled to is now erected these days. You have politicians who simply will not acknowledge, will not talk to reporters. Um, and, you know, it's a little bit of a choose your adventure thing here because now you have partisan, in quotes, news sources that have cropped up. And the excuse made by people in elective offices, well, I am talking to the news. I'm just talking to those folks. But those folks are not really in the interest uh, or don't have the interest in any in interest in telling uh, facts and, and truth. They've just got a, a partisan agenda that they're trying to put, put forward. Um, we will not be deterred. I mean, the, 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 the thing that I try to tell everybody in, 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 in political office or, or public life who decides not to, to, uh, to play uh, in the sandbox with us is it doesn't matter. We will do our jobs with you or without you. We're not going to be deterred from our important public service work. There is nothing you can do to knock us off track. Mm -hmm. Is it harder, Aaron? It's harder. Is it less pleasant these days? I'm not sure it was ever actually pleasant. Is it less pleasant? Yes. Are there people in elective office in Texas who will not sit down with the Texas Tribune to do either an interview in, in public or to do a conversation behind the scenes that informs our reporting? Yeah, there are. Yeah. Um, I, I think it's nuts, but 
what has the last two years told us, but that we are living in the United States of nuts much of the time. So yeah. it's okay. Yeah. And not only will we not be deterred, but we're not going to stop asking, right? Of like, we, no, of course not. Like you are still welcome to this conversation. We still want you to be a part of this discourse because you are part of this democracy, you know? And I think, uh, you know, as we were talking about, I think um, one of the most important lessons that we've learned from 2020, 2016 and, and beyond is that, uh, you know, there are too many people who do not know the folks in their community, uh, the yeah. people they go to church with, their neighbors, uh, their kids, parents, uh, kids, friends, parents. Uh, they don't they don't know those people and, and, and they're not going to know them unless uh, we are all engaging in this together. And it's one thing to have, you right. know, um, par partisan and political uh, or partisan politics. But, you know, if you have partisan journalism where everybody's just kind of in their own corners, you know, that doesn't really um, that doesn't really bode well for us. Uh, you know, kind of coming back together as a society and a democracy. I this mean, is I, one of those areas, Aaron, where the disappearance of the newspaper in every community or the, yes. the decline of the newspaper has been so uh, problematic because that used to be the public square. That used Absolutely. to be the place where people, Absolutely. old, young, black, white, and brown, you know, Democrat, Republican used to come together. They, they, it was a shared experience. It was some a place where we litigated our differences, right? Yes. Today, speaking, you know, called it the United States of nuts. Now let me call it the United States of confirmation bias. We walk down the streets of our cities with headphones in our ears, listening to our preferred satellite radio channel or cable channel or podcast of preference. You can go a day or a week or a lifetime today without encountering somebody because you choose not to who disagrees with you. All you end up with is this kind of cycle of self-affirmation. Yeah. You exile yourself into this cocoon of affirmation, and you never actually have any encounters with people who disagree with you, who don't think like you. Or, or I, it's, I just, I, this is what's killing us. I think I really I, do. So I, I, I'm with you 100 percent on that. No, and I absolutely agree with you. So how do we, how do we get the AirPods out and get back to civil, yeah. civic discourse in our politics? And how can journalism be part of the solution? in that, do you think? Well, I've always believed that there's no problem in our democracy and there's no problem in our journalism that can't be solved by more and better and more ambitious and robust journalism. I mean, I, I come back to us being the antidote to this to the degree that anything is the antidote. We've got to continue to put good information, good facts, uh, smart perspectives, measured, reasonable perspectives in front of people as much as possible, not be part of the problem, be part of the solution. And hopefully you push out the, the, the bad and you push out the, the noise. Um, we can't do it alone, but we have to not give up. We have to continue to do it, continue to do it. I'm, I'm mindful of what Marty Barron, who I admire so much, who was the editor of the Washington Post, said when President Trump started attacking the Post early in his administration. He would start attacking the paper. He would attack reporters by name. And Marty Barron said something to the effect of our job is not to go to war. Our job is to go to work. Yeah. My view is that as long as journalism and journalists go to work, do the hard work of telling people what they need to know, um, we're, we're, we're going to prevail here. Um, I'm not giving up on democracy. I'm not giving up on journalism. I'm not giving up on us talking to people we don't uh, uh, break bread with right now. The, that, that work is essential to all of us uh, uh, getting past the difficult times we're in right now. Yeah. Yeah. But look, I also think that part of that work, especially for us as journalists, as political journalists, is to really have a handle on who and where we are as a democracy. And I want to ask you if you think that our political journalism class as a whole has learned the lessons of 2008, of 2016, of 2020. Yeah. There's a little bit too much fascination with access. Um, I think many of our friends in the business era, and not you and me, of course, but others I'm talking about, um, understand that they are the new celebrities, that the cable channels and the satellite radio channels and Twitter have turned them into the, the, the Brangelinas of their day. And I think we have to get over ourselves. I think we have to get over ourselves. I think to some degree we've lost our minds and lost our way. And we've forgotten what this is about. Um, I think there are extraordinarily good, well-meaning, well-intentioned, hardworking mission-focused political journalists in every news organization in the country. I don't judge everybody by a couple of people who are distracted by Klieg lights. Um, I do think that there is something about the celebrity uh, nature of, of political journalism these days that does deter us all, does detract from uh, what what the purpose of this is, which is to hold people in power accountable. I mean, that that that's... 
At the end of the day, our job is to hold people in power and institutions accountable without regard to party partisanship or ideology. It is not about us. It is about the greater them. And when it becomes about us as journalists, I think we, we, we get off track. No, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, um, certainly the, the platform that, that I have, the platform that you have, I mean, the point of that is uh, to, to further the work and, and to continue to hold right. people accountable and to bear witness for so many of these people that, that frankly aren't able to go right. into these halls of power. Uh, you know, we right. do this on, on their behalf, uh, not on our own behalf. I would never want to be referred to as the Brangelina of anything. Uh, <laughs> well, I mean, but, uh, you know, I guess to that end, though, um, you know, the big lie lives on, uh, obviously, uh, far beyond the 2020 election. It is metastasized. It is making its way into our infrastructure, into our upcoming elections. I wonder who you think is doing a better job of covering uh, the big lie and issues of voter suppression. This is obviously something that's a huge issue in Texas, in my home state of Georgia. Um, right. So who's doing the better job of covering this, local or national news outlets? And where do you think the story is? Well, I think the national news outlets are doing a good job of holding the people who are perpetuating the big lie at a very high level accountable. I mean, I, I don't take issue with the way that reporters from the Washington Post and the New York Times, for instance, are reporting on the persistence of this storyline. I mean, the complete absence of evidence of widespread fraud. Uh, I think I think reporters at the big news organizations have done a, a fine job on that. But at the local level, you know, we have an extraordinary reporter on voting and elections at the Texas Tribune named Alexa Ura, who has been working with us for a number of years, started with us when she was in college at the University of Texas, came to work for us covering the intersection of demographics and policy and really has morphed into what I think is the very best reporter at a local level on voting and elections. Uh, today, she was reporting on uh, the you know, you could argue that, that they're either the unintentional or the intentional products of the overhaul of election law that happened in Texas, similar to one that happened in your home state of Georgia, that has resulted in not only an unprecedented number of mail ballot applications being rejected at the local level, but ballots submitted being returned. Um, uh, you know, the, the, we and others said the overhaul of election law might very well result in fewer people being able to take advantage of the access access to vote. And, and at least in the early days of this law being in place, that's uh, what we think we're seeing. I think the people on the ground who are watching, whether you call it voter suppression, voter protection, what have you, this whole battle, this whole thing play out, the local people are essential. Our state legislatures are really where the action is right now. Yeah. These are the people who are passing the laws that material, materially impact all of our lives. So I appreciate the scoops in the Times and the Post about, you know, Trump did this and Pence did that. And this effort was made to, you know, kind of seize voting machines or a discussion of seizing voting, all that sort of stuff. Fine. Um, and look, I appreciate the national journalists who, who are calling BS on the big live. Uh, Jake Tapper, my friend, was in Austin to do an event with the Texas Tribune back in November. And he remarked casually that he refuses on the two shows that he hosts on CNN to book any guests who believe in the big lie. Anybody who will not say the election was not stolen, there was no widespread fraud, Joe Biden is legitimately the president, he will not have them as guests. And I said, really, you're able to do that? He said, yes, we are making a point of not allowing anybody to come on our program who believes that to spread this thing. Yeah. I mean, that's 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 a statement, yeah. that's a stand. And I admire that stand. We are in the business of telling people the truth. We're not yeah. in the business of providing a platform for the opposite of the truth. No, and that's what you end up doing. You're exactly right. I mean, look, I think it, one of the big changes that we made to the 19th, even in our our uh, our uh, first couple of years of, of existence was was really changing our description from being, uh, you know, nonprofit, nonpartisan to nonprofit independent. And, and that was largely, you know, in the wake of January 6th and, and just the acknowledgement that, you, you know, we're not, we're not both sizing <laughs> like January 6th or, or, or um, the false threat of, of uh, to election integrity that, that is being pushed, um, you know, because, that, you know, at the end of the day, we're here to leave behind the most honest and accurate record of who and where we are as a country. And right. that just doesn't serve that. Uh, well, that, you know, that, what I tell people, Aaron, all the time is nonpartisan is not non-thinking. When yeah, BS exactly. needs to be called, we call BS. 
And I do think that the, the, the discussion once upon a time in our lifetimes of whether it was OK for a journalism organization to call somebody a liar or to call out something as a lie seems so antiquated to me. At this point. Absolutely. Because we have people in high office who are routinely telling us lies. Yeah. Provable falsehoods. We as journalists have an obligation and a responsibility to call that stuff out. And if we don't do it, we're not journalists. Yeah. No, that's again, right. We are here to provide an honest and accurate record. Uh, and that that is that is our role. Uh, I want to just thank uh, those of you who have already started submitting questions uh, for this conversation. Please continue to do so. And we're going to try to get to as many of those as we can in just a little bit here. But we're going to continue our conversation. Uh, I want to ask you, um, you know, it, it feels like certainly over the 19th, we are covering the women, people of color, LGBTQ plus folks and other marginalized people who are at the center of so many of the culture wars that we see playing out right now across the country. Um, you know, is that is that your sense too, that that's really who's at the center of this conversation? And how, how do you feel like um, political journalism is doing it covering that story? So let me give you three examples of, of narratives, uh, storylines that we have been pursuing for the better part of a year. All of them, I think, come back to underserved communities and, 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 and women who end up being the targets of these efforts. So obviously yes. on the abortion question, yes. Texas decided to jump ahead of Mississippi in line to try to get Roe versus Wade overturned. The assumption was that the Supreme Court taking the Mississippi case would potentially be the end of Roe. But then the Texas law passed in our last legislative session, the so-called heartbeat bill limiting abortion at, well, they said six weeks, but in fact, it may be really practically speaking, fewer than six weeks, right. has become the the engine for uh, a discussion about a post-Roe uh, world. Who, who are the people on the receiving end uh, in our communities uh, of, of that uh, decision at the legislature? And, and who are the people we're writing about and writing for? Who are the people we're centering in our journalism? It is the women of, of, of Texas first uh, and principally. Um, on the critical race theory uh, discussion, which is, again, not limited to Texas, but has been a pretty present and pronounced conversation here in Texas. Yeah. A ban on critical race theory passed our legislature. Aaron, I'll tell you right now that if I pulled 10 people off the floor of the Texas legislature who voted for the ban on critical race theory and said, can you define critical race theory? They couldn't. Huh. So we're now in the business of telling people in schools around the state what they can and cannot teach, whose history they can and cannot teach. Um, and then, of course, we talked about voting already and the overhaul of voting laws. It is communities of color that end up being disproportionately targeted when it comes to a conversation around access to the ballot box. In the case of the critical race theory stories, the voting stories, the abortion stories, we are centering people from underserved, disadvantaged communities. They are the people who are on the receiving end of this. They're the people with the least amount of power, the least amount of power to advocate for themselves. You know, you mentioned earlier about... Um, who is and is not in power? We have a legislature that is older, whiter, and maler than the state it represents in the yes. decisions it makes, the laws it passes. Um, the legislature looks nothing like Texas. So maybe no wonder the people who we're writing about and for, who we're centering in our stories, don't actually have their own voices in the room when these decisions are being made because the diversity of our legislature is nothing like the diversity of our state. I do think that we as news organizations have an obligation to center people in the communities affected by decisions like this in our story. This is not a remote exercise, right? It's not a remote exercise. We have to put the people affected in our stories. You know, we believe that at the 19th. I mean, I while we are removed from Washington, certainly we cover uh, what, what is happening, but how those policies are impacting the daily lives of our audiences is is right. really what what we believe this thing is all about too. So, uh, okay, let's have a bit of a lightning round here. Okay. Uh, what would you say is the most undercovered politics story right now? The most undercovered politics story in Texas right now, in Texas or nationally? Texas and nationally. You know, I think the assumptions made about what the 2020 election told us about the political views of Hispanics in Texas and the voting habits of Hispanics, this was anything but a typical election cycle. I would like to see an election cycle in which both parties are actively out campaigning, putting their ideas and issues in front of voters up and down the Texas-Mexico border in South Texas counties, 
in the big urban areas where there where there are a, a big Hispanic populations. I think we have taken the results of the 2020 election as the gospel for how politics is transforming in this state. Yeah. And I frankly don't know that I think that's the case. It may mm -hmm. prove to be, but I think we need to do a big, much deeper dive. Let me say this, because you asked about undercovered. Certainly this has been covered. I don't think it has been sufficiently covered. I don't I think there's been sufficient investigation into how demographics and politics have converged and diverged. Yeah. Yeah, no, I look, I think the story of the Latino vote uh, local uh, in Texas and nationally is something yeah. that there's still time for people to turn their attention to if they want to in 22, 24 and beyond. Uh, OK, uh, race is your following in 22. Well, I'm not following a whole lot of races in Texas, except to the extent that because we cover politics in Texas, we have to. I mean, right? the fact is that because of the nature of the first midterm of a president's administration, the president's party typically gets shellacked back in the states. It happened in 2010 with Obama. Republicans ran the table here. It happened in 2018 with Trump. Democrats, who have not had much to celebrate electorally for about 25 years, did much right. better in Texas than they typically do. I think everybody is expecting a shellacking for the Democrats and a good cycle for the Republicans in Texas. We don't have competitive general elections because of redistricting and because we really don't have a fully functioning two-party system in the state of Texas. So I'm kind of looking elsewhere. I'm yeah. very interested. I'm very interested in a Raphael Warnock Herschel Walker uh, uh, contest potentially in uh, Georgia. Um, I'm really interested to see. Uh, uh, you know, I, I look. I, I think that the the a lot of focus on the battle for the control of the U.S. House because again, yeah. typically in a cycle like this one, the president's party will do poorly in the in the House, and the assumption is well, the Republicans are going to win control back of the majority in the U.S. House. Not a lot of discussion, though, of the Senate. Right. Which, after all, is 50-50. Yeah. No, it, listen, and and and, right. and 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 average age is well into the 60s. So, you Correct. Know, I mean, this idea that if Patrick Leahy gets a cold or, God forbid, this poor man in, um, in New on. Mexico who got us, who had a stroke, that it's the business 50. of the country shuts down because the split between the parties is what it is. Yeah. I, I do think that these Senate races are fascinating, and I am as interested, if not more interested, in what happens in the control of the U.S. Senate. No, I'm right there with you. And let me just add to that. I am looking to see which, if any, of these Black women can break through uh, so that there is a Black woman or Black women, again, uh, in the United States Senate. Never been more. Are, are you looking at the Val Demings, Marco Rubio yeah, races, maybe the, one to watch there? Definitely looking at the Val <clears throat> Demings race, looking at North Carolina as well. Um and uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think that there there is potential. And, and as far as we're concerned at the 19th, somebody's electable when you elect them, you know. So who's to say, you know, just because somebody comes in a certain package or they've never you know, had a role before that, that they're not the person for the job. I think the voters uh, should be the ones who decide that. Uh, speaking yeah. of first, anybody in Texas that Biden is overlooking for his historic Supreme Court nominee? Uh, no names have popped up. You know, the, the today in an interview with Lester Holt that I gather is going to air during the Super Bowl, the president apparently said he's got it narrowed down to four. We have seen, you and I have seen lists of five, six, seven right. exceptional black women who would be more than qualified for the Supreme Court. And I think they're all great potential candidates. And it'll become clear to us who he prefers, uh, you know, uh, 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 pretty soon. And then we'll see whether the votes are there in the Senate uh, uh, to confirm. I mean, my suspicion is this is going to be um, less complicated than it could be, but more complicated than it has to be, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, but, but no, 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 nothing, and nobody in Texas has come up as a potential um, as a potential candidate. Yeah, well, I mean, to your point, time is definitely of the essence uh, for all the reasons that we mentioned before. Correct. What do you think? Is Donald Trump going to run for president again in twenty twenty four? My stated position is I don't believe Donald Trump or Joe Biden will be the nominees of their parties in 2024. I'm sticking with that until I'm proven wrong. Well, we will stay tuned for that on both sides. Yeah. Um, and, you know, Texas had the second most arrests in the insurrection. Uh, I'm wondering how I, you hmm. think we should be talking about this slow rolling coup, frankly, uh, which is what it is. And if you think Americans are interested in the details of what happened on January 6th and how we got to the insurrection, and if you think they should be. My, my wife, who is the smartest person I know, keeps saying to me every day, we need public hearings, we need public hearings, we need public hearings, we need public hearings. 
The one six commission seems to be doing really pretty great work. And there's a lot behind the scenes that we don't know to try to get to the truth, not having prejudged one or another of the findings that we'll ultimately get from this, uh, from this body. But the public's attention needs to be turned in the direction of this. It can't be catch as catch can. Mm -hmm. Um, I do think we're going to get some answers. I mean, part of this is a race against the clock back to your previous question. Anybody think that if the Republicans take back control of the House, that the one six commission won't be disbanded as the first act of the majority and a new speaker? So the window is the window is is limited to actually get the work of this commission done. And we'll have to see as Americans, as citizens, if we want to get to the bottom of this, we're going to have to giddy up. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Well, uh, looking ahead and looking back a little bit now, uh, as was mentioned earlier, hundreds of news outlets have sprung up in the wake of the Tribune over over your tenure. What would you say is the Tribune's legacy so far? And what is your legacy as you prepare to step down? Well, I, I mean, I'm I'm not necessarily in 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 writing on the tombstone for myself territory yet. Um, I mean, I'll try to come fumble fumble around for an answer on that. I want to do say what I think the Tribune's legacy has been, and, and is, and that is that we have shown people that this work is both important and possible. Um, I've been asked a lot over the last four weeks about the most important things that we accomplished over the last 13 years, and certainly to my mind maybe the most important mission, 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 is that we have given people every day a reason to believe that they have a right to this information, a reason to pay attention, that this stuff matters. It matters to their lives. It matters to the lives of their friends and neighbors. It matters to their communities. And we've demonstrated every single day to people in office who are paid by taxpayer dollars that we're watching them and that we're going to continue to hold them to account. To to me, that's a huge legacy, is simply reminding people that this stuff matters and that being civically engaged is important. But But I think that really to take from your question this idea that there are all these organizations around the country that have sprung up in our in our wake and are taking lessons from our playbook or pages from our playbook um, emulating us acknowledging and we appreciate that some sort of debt to the to, to the tribune for the for the model that we created or the lessons that we taught them um, I really believe that all over the country, there is a need for this kind of work in every state capital, in every community. Everybody deserves a reliable, credible source of news. And if by our inspiration and lesson, we have given people the means to go and pursue that and to try to realize that for their communities, there is no greater legacy than demonstrating that this work is important and possible and that the economics of it can be made to work. This stuff can be paid for. There is money in every community in every state to support this kind of serious journalism. We've raised more than $100 million in a little more than 12 years to pay for serious journalism. We have persuaded people and institutions to part with their money to support the media by saying to them, it is in your interest and the public interest to pay for explanatory and accountability journalism, which is amazing to me. And I think in every community, there is the opportunity to do that. And and if, if we've inspired a movement as far as that goes, it's the best possible legacy we could have. Well, there's absolutely no if. Thank you for showing us the way and for 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 uh, giving us the blueprint. We really, I mean, seriously, uh, I think journalism in general, but particularly those of us who have followed in your wake are absolutely uh, in your debt for what you all built. Uh, and speaking of, of what you built, I mean, you were able to build this yeah. national brand out of Texas, which is certainly not about the celebrity that you alluded to earlier. But yeah. um, I think there is something to be said for brand loyalty and what that says for people in terms of your credibility. Uh, just talk to me a little bit about how you did it and what it took. Well, look, first of all, I have to acknowledge a debt to Texas, right? Texas is the center of the news universe at all times, usually in good and bad ways simultaneously. This is the place where the big issues of our day, the conversations we're all having around dinner tables and locker rooms and office water coolers, they begin here. The big issues that are the national issues often enough begin here. The big players in the big national conversations often have a connection. You know, we joke all the time. There's always a Texas connection. There really legitimately is almost always a Texas connection. Um, That's not to say that the Vermont Tribune or the Idaho Tribune could not and would not have become a national 
a, a journalism brand, but the material here practically writes itself. Um, it's such a rich, such a rich amount of material to, to mine every single day. There's, we never lack for material. Um, I think that the country is fascinated uh, by Texas. I, look, I think there's a lot about Texas that the country admires. Uh, our economy has been so unbelievably resilient through downturns over my lifetime. We, we continually top the list of the best places to work, the best places to live. The state of Texas, my adopted home, but I've lived here for more than 30 years, is truly the most wonderful place on earth. I love it. I wouldn't take any place else. I would, I would never leave. I love this place more than I've loved any place ever. But also one of the things about loving a place is you got to be honest with yourself about it. And you've got to be willing to have hard conversations with other people and with yourselves about the areas of work that we need to do. And over the years, Texas has provided us with ample opportunity to note ways in which we don't live up to our words. You know, there is this concept, Aaron, you know it, of Texas exceptionalism. Time and again, we see that we're not exceptional, we're mortal. And again, from a policy and politics standpoint that we cover every day, example after example of ways in which we we don't match our, our words with our actions on that. So I think the brand has been built partly by the fascination with Texas and people wanting a news organization to explain Texas to the rest of the country. We're happy to be those those, those folks to do it. Yeah, well, I mean, look, with all due respect, though, part of the brand being built was you. I mean, you put this thing on your back as CEO and co-founder and really, um, you know, you don't think we don't think about the Texas Tribune without thinking of Evan Smith. Uh, what what was that like? I mean, 13 years ago, were you somebody who uh, was really used to being that public facing? I think of myself, you know, my roots are in, in print journalism for sure. I certainly didn't think I was going to be on television <laughs> at all, uh, you know, as, as a young reporter. But here here we are, uh, you know, uh, two folks who people, you know, maybe recognize at the airport every now and then. I don't know. Um, you know, you, you, you what, become the person you're meant to be. Look, Aaron, I'll say about you and the role that you play as, as someone who explains uh, the news and explains the world to all of us on television is you seem like you were born ready and able to do it. I, I'm, I'm a little bit more reluctant as much as it may seem like this is something I just, I mean, to my own, in my own mind, I feel reluctant. I'm kind of a, a, an introvert masquerading as an extrovert. This is what the work demands and requires. Um, I was not as, as much... Um, interested in being the public face of this or any organization back 13 years ago. I simply wanted to see if this thing could get off the ground yes. and be successful. But I will also tell you that the Texas Tribune is all of us at the Texas Tribune. It is not me. I am less relevant to the functioning of this place, the success of this place today than ever before. Um, I absolutely believe that this organization is larger than one person and has transcended me and any one person at this place long ago. It is a battleship. It is it is a it is a, a an incredible operation that I think um, you know I've been very fortunate to play a role. I've been lucky to be able to play a lead role and in helping this thing get successful. But long ago, the mission of this organization took over as the as the driver and as the uh, as the attraction. Um, I will look forward to no longer being uh, the public face of this place because I know that it's going to be in good hands and the. Uh, in the person of whoever comes in behind me. And, you know, the reality is, Aaron, that if you can do good, you should do good, right? I mean, you and I both, I think, in that way, understand that if this is what we're called to do, we should do it. And yeah. if we can make the world better through the work that we do, and if it requires us to be as introverts masquerading as extroverts, if it requires us to be out in front of a camera from time to time, so be it. But never forget that there are a lot of people who do the work behind us who yes. don't really get the credit that they deserve. And in our case, we have an entire staff, nearly 85 people full time. Every one of those people is every bit as much responsible for our success as I am. Yeah, I 1000% I agree with you. And and the space that you have made uh, by way of you being so public facing, the space you've created for others ensures yeah. that that um, that in your absence, uh, those folks will absolutely uh absolutely be stepping up and, and stepping in and getting uh, the attention that, that they also uh, rightly deserve. I wonder, um, you know, you're thinking about uh, your legacy here, th time's winding down. Do you yeah. have any regrets? Is there anything you wish you'd done differently? <clears throat> you know, I, I don't, I tend not to regret. Um, that's not to say that I don't think I make or we make mistakes. One of the problems I have with journalism is that we are too arrogant about um, our, our perfection, yeah. our infallibility. We're no different than anybody else. We're human. We're flawed. We make mistakes. I think sometimes we're too defensive when mistakes we make are pointed out. We ought to be 
grateful to people who point out the mistakes we make so that we can correct them as aggressively and visibly as we made them and then move on. And I think instead, sometimes we get ourselves bollocked up or bottled up in this whole, you know, well, we didn't really do what you say we did. And, you know, again, come back to the very first question you asked about trust, where we talked about trust early on. Part of the reason that people don't trust us is we give them reason not to in our reactions to their criticism of us. Yeah. We hold other people accountable. We should be willing to hold ourselves accountable in moments like that. Um, so, I mean, I, you know, I, I, I spend a lot of time thinking about that. Let me just say, um, I don't have regret necessarily, but I acknowledge that we as an industry need to be better. We, we, we don't do a good enough job of accepting and acknowledging the responsibility that we sometimes have for creating the problems that we lament. Like that, like the way we react to people when they criticize us, I think is is in many cases a cell phone. We ought to yeah. just get over ourselves, get over it, be humble, don't be so arrogant, don't be so defensive. Do you have an example of that uh, that that you can share with us about a time that you had to do that? Oh, I can think of a ton of times over the last thirteen years when we, as an organization, have said things that turned out not to be true. We went into it with best intentions, did the work. But ultimately, we stumbled along the way and did something unintentionally that got facts wrong or characterized a situation different from how it should have been characterized. To pick on one story would cause me to pick on one of our journalists. And I'm not going to single out a specific journalist. But I will tell you that I bleed over every correction we publish. Mm -hmm. As every CEO and every editor-in-chief ought to bleed. Because you never want to get anything wrong. You always want to get everything right. Because the times that you get things wrong give people the reason to doubt whether you, the, the things that you, you you do on an ongoing basis are correct. So um, I just always want us to be on our best behavior, always want us to be on our best game, do our best work, and and not be so caught up in fighting with people. Yeah. Right. I, I think sometimes we get baited into having arguments with people in the audience of our news organizations, and I think that's also a, 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 a no-win situation. Absolutely. And it's and part of it's it's a defensiveness as, as well, right? I mean it, that that's definitely part of it. Too. We get our say, they get their say, respect people, don't get don't get tripped up by that. Yeah, yeah. Uh well I, I also um want to ask you a little bit about I mean, listen, if 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 the Tribune is, is your child, uh, you know, there are those of us out here who are your grandchildren. Hello. <laughs> Uh, yeah. Several new outlets have launched, uh, you know, in the past couple of years, the 19th, yeah. obviously, Punchbowl, Puck, Capital B. Why do you think this is happening now? And do you think that we'll see more? And yeah. what do you think about just the diversity of the outlets that are launching? Which of these startups are exciting you? Right. Well, you've mentioned a couple that are nonprofit, like the 19th and Capital B. You've mentioned a couple that are for profit, like Puck and Punchbowl News. I would mention, you know, Sahan Journal in Minnesota, which I think is an extraordinary uh, young uh, uh you know, only been doing this for a couple of years, but another one of these great uh, startups. Um, look, I, 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 I am excited about the fact that more people are crossing over from the for-profit side to the nonprofit side. Back when I started with a couple of others, the Tribune, a story ran in the New York Times on the day that I announced I was leaving Texas Monthly Magazine, where I'd been president and editor-in-chief to leave there to go to start the Text Tribune. The headline in the New York Times was something to the effect of Texas Monthly Editor leaving to join local web news startup. That's what they called us, local web news startup. It was almost mocking. I don't think that there was any yeah. intent there. But the idea that somebody would leave a successful career on the for-profit side of our business and migrate over to this weird non-profit journalism world. 13 years later, Lauren Williams leaves Vox and goes to, to uh, as, as part of a group of folks starting a capital B, no one is mocking Lauren Williams and should not be mocking Lauren Williams for doing that. No, no one her. today looks two ways at somebody who leaves a, a for-profit to jump into a nonprofit space. There is more opportunity, more need, more money available to do it. The case has been proven. Um, I think a path's been cleared. I, you know, I, I when, when Capital B was announced, I, I, I think I was one of the first people to send them some money. Um, I believe in what Lauren and Okoto and everybody else at Capital okay. B are doing. I believe in that. Uh, I, I believe that anybody who has an idea, I mean, when Emily Ramshaw came to me in this very office in April of 2019, she was outside my office. I was here one morning on the phone or on the computer and she was standing out.
outside the office. And it was kind of like she was kicking the dirt. And I couldn't figure out what she was doing. And I looked out the window and I waved and I said, come in, come in, come in. And she came in and she said, basically, I've got this idea in my head and I can't get rid of it. I think I'm going to have to leave. And I thought two things. I thought, first of all, oh, crap, because she is about one of the greatest people on the, on the entire planet who I adore. I mean, like family and who was a fantastic journalist and was a fantastic editor of this organization. And I saw immediately what a void would be created by her departure to go do something else. But the second thing I thought was, I understand because 10 years earlier, I was exactly where she was with the idea of the Texas Tribune in my, my own head, unable to get it out of my head. Um, what Emily and Amanda Zamora, who both left the Tribune to come and join you as founding mothers of the 19th did, was demonstrate for other people that there's a way forward as we hopefully 2009 demonstrated to people now doing their work that there's a way forward. Th this is really an emerging ecosystem of collaborators, people who are rooting one another on, yes, um, who believe in one another and believe in this extraordinary opportunity that exists now. The reason that the people we're talking about, plus the people on the for-profit side, Jake Sherman, Anna Palmer, John Bresnahan, who I adore at Punchbowl News, the people who are starting Teddy Schlieffer at, at Puck and others, uh, you know, who are doing the work that they're doing at those organizations, they now see that they have the means of production in their hands. They know that they don't need big institutions. This is a moment for entrepreneurs, dreamers yes. to go out there and, and start anything. I tell young people, people in college all the time. I know you think that this is a bad time to go into journalism. This has never been a better time to go do Great. this right? There is more opportunity created. You can have an idea today and tomorrow create something amazing and change the world. Yes. And I think the 19th is changing the world. I do. I'd like to think that we've had a small part of changing the world. And I think the people who come behind us, Lauren and Nakoto, are going to change the world. Mukhtar Ibrahim at Sahan Journal is going to change the world. I, I just want everybody who's doing this work to know that there's an ecosystem and a support system around them. And, and this is the future. This is the, and I, I couldn't be more hopeful about it. Yeah. What a time, right? And, and absolutely. Time. I mean, it, 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 there's strength in numbers. I really do believe that. And so Agreed. the more of us Agreed. that are in this work together and that are cheering each other on and pulling each other along, uh, I, I think that that is definitely part of uh, kind of the secret sauce. Well, listen, you brought up, um, you brought up the economic model more than once. Uh, the 19th, uh, as we've mentioned, is a nonprofit newsroom as well. <clears throat> Talk about the funding models and the benefit to being a nonprofit for folks who might be thinking of taking this leap. Right. Well, I mean, look, I think there's not necessarily um, only one right way to do this. Like everything else in life, uh, Aaron, there's a million wrong ways and no one right way. It doesn't have to be my right way. It just has to be a right way. But yeah. our right way has been a very diverse revenue model for us that includes support from wealthy individuals and family offices, institutional philanthropy foundations corporate support, underwriting, kind of like what you see on PBS or NPR, where you have corporations that support as underwriters, might look like advertising, but in fact, it's a different kind of sponsorship. Right. We get a certain amount of money out of the events that we produce pre-pandemic. We were doing more than 50 events a year around the state of wow. Texas, an average of one a week. The big Texas Tribune Festival is obviously the most visible of those, but we do events all the time in four corners of the state. And then about 20% or so, a little bit less of our revenue annually is uh, small dollar and higher dollar memberships. Um, that revenue diversity has insulated us against economic downturns. It provides us with a number of different buckets to draw from. I tend to be a little bit less interested in models, economic models that rely on only one source of revenue. But there are ways to generate money to support this kind of work out in every community. And I know the 19th has followed not exactly the same playbook, but has raised money from the likes of wealthy individuals, foundations, some corporate support, doing really robust and interesting events that are supported as well. Um, what we're not in the business of, we are not, and you at the 19th are not, and many of the folks we're talking about, we're not in the business of reselling eyeballs to advertisers. Right. This is not a transactional economic model. And it frees us up from making bad decisions journalistically. I always want to do the right thing. I always want to be in the business of serving the public interest. And untethering ourselves from economic considerations allows us to do that as no other model I'm aware of allows us to do it. Now, we have to maintain our integrity from our sources of funding, just as our brothers and sisters on the for-profit side have to do, by the way. No different. Right. Right. My view is, and I've said this maybe in your presence before, I can always get more money. I can never get more integrity. 
it is critical that the organizations we run have absolute independence from our sources of funding and absolute unimpeachable integrity, visible integrity. But I do think it's possible. And again, the organizations we're talking about are all proving with their fundraising and the great work they're producing, it is possible to do this work. Nonprofit is not the only way forward. It is a way forward. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Well, uh, your advice to anybody who is thinking about launching a newsroom today. Right. Do it. Um, the first thing you need is a good idea. you got to prove that the idea has uh, an audience that it would reach an audience unserved by that thing. I'm not a big believer in creating an organization that is exactly like another organization in business, but only we're going to do it better. Yeah. You know, hit them where they ain't. Look for the negative spaces. Figure out what audience is not being served. We went specifically in the area of politics and policy because that was the coverage that was significantly in decline or full on missing from the existing media organizations in Texas. I don't see the value in simply replicating what other people are doing for the purpose of seeing if you can succeed at it more than they can or doing better than they can. Identify a market that's unserved, but have a really good idea and then identify people who might be supportive of that idea and can provide you with the funding to get you off the ground. I don't think you have to have every problem solved on the first day. Not the economic problem, not any other problem, but get yourselves off the ground. And, and then, you know, don't be afraid to make mistakes. The biggest advice I give people is don't be risk averse. What's killing American media, I think, is a complete aversion to risk. You mm. cannot take a big chance on doing something creative and innovative if the likelihood of it not succeeding is too high. Nobody can afford to fail. We have more like a technology business, a fail fast uh, approach. We're willing to try anything in service to greatness. Yes. And I think we all have to take chances. I know that when I talked to Emily about the 19th in the run up to that, she had that same willingness to court risk and to take chances as she imagined what this thing might look like. And I'm convinced that is a material reason for her success, for your success. Agreed. And not being afraid to evolve, even even as you are new. Being, a, be, being 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 flexible and, and being able to evolve, especially as right. we grow, right? And, and may I say also that we are, you know, you, you are incredibly young and dynamic. I am old. Um, but I also know that the generation coming up behind us of consumers of this kind of information and content have different habits. Absolutely. We have to make a part of our plan. Like I remember when we started the Tribune, there was a discussion of... of um, we, we needed to be platform agnostic was what was said to me. you got to have one strategy for distributing your content regardless of the platform. Today, you hear people say we got to be platform devout. You have to have a different strategy for every platform because the audiences on every platform are different. That to me is one of the many things that's evolved over time is the way you think about the Instagrams and the Snapchats and the Reddits and the TikToks, the Twitters and the Facebooks of the world and how that becomes a method for you to get your content in front of the oh, audience absolutely. you want to reach. And that, and so I think, again, as you say, be willing to pivot, be willing to evolve, be willing to change as circumstances want. Yeah. And, and platform promiscuous is what I say. I mean, look, we, what? as far as we're concerned, you know, what we know about uh, these folks coming up behind us that are consuming our content is that, uh, you know, before it was uh, an expectation that they would come to us. And now they very much expect us to go to them. And, it's and push, have, not pull. We have to go to them. We don't wait for them to come to us. I am particular. And look, I've got a 25 year old and a 21 year old. They are my every day focus group. Focus group. Absolutely. They don't, they don't live in my house, but we certainly talk about the media that they consume. Yes. And I try to understand from them their consumption habits, which, by the yes. way, even the 25 and 21 are not exactly the same. Right. Right. Um, it, it, it helps me understand better the, 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 again, the mountain we have to climb every day, a different mountain is how you reach people in the generation behind us. So. Yeah. And also just being self-aware. I mean, how, how our consumption habits have changed, you know, even, yeah. even as journalists, you know, how, how I'm getting my news is not the way that I was getting it, you know, 13 years ago. So certainly if, if I know right. that about myself using that and thinking about that, when we think about how we expect other people to find, uh, what it is that we're trying to get. Cause like you said, uh, you know, this is journalism that we want to reach as many people 
as possible. And, and that means going to where they are. So right. uh, I also observe that, you know, in a, in a state like just one last point is that in a state like Texas, where the population is changing so dramatically, we have to be thinking strategically about how we reach the emerging majority population. Yes. And it is yes. not going to be the same as reaching the previous majority populations. No. Right. Collaboration, no. partnerships. I mean, it's a whole bunch of different things. Yes. Ethnic media, absolutely part of this conversation, too, which is a huge part of the local journalism ecosystem. So, uh, OK, so I'm going to pivot now because we've got some questions from the audience. So thank you so much uh, for everybody that submitted questions. Uh, this question is from Dan Alpert in Troy, Michigan. OK, can you talk about the practice of journalism, expectations of objectivity versus writers desire to share their lived experience? Well, I think that it's a question of whose objectivity you're talking about. Aaron, uh -huh. I think we should talk about this together because I don't think my definition of objectivity necessarily is anybody else's based on my own experience. I mean, I, I, I think that every news organization is wrestling with this question of what objectivity is, sure. right? Is it even a thing? No. I mean, look, I, personally, uh, Dan, I will tell you, uh, objectivity has always been a myth for me, but that is because I know that uh, the idea of objectivity in journalism was conceived by people who were white and male, uh, you know, at the beginning of journalism. And if white and male is your default setting, it's very easy to be objective or to talk about objectivity. Like, who does that leave out when we're talking about being objective? Um, and, and in terms of, you know, writers lived experience, listen, I mean, I think one of the great things about the 19th is that we encourage people to bring their lived experience to work uh, because we believe that that is an asset and not a liability to their storytelling. <clears throat> that's something that I think a lot of us who uh, were trained in journalism were taught to leave at the door. Uh, and yet we know that um, you know all of the identities that we bring to this work uh, give us a very unique lens to seeing stories that other people may not see. And that's a good thing as far as, far as we're concerned. That's a thing that people uh, I think need to lean more into because uh, I think that most of us are realizing or should be realizing by now that the, the idea that, that folks are not bringing their lived experience to the work uh, is, is that's not that's not real. Well, and the fact is, our journalism is made better by the lived experience of our journalists. Yes, uh, absolutely. Be, 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 being part of the conversation. So, I mean, I'm 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 100 percent with you on that. I think this is a, a conversation that the industry has taken too long to con to confront, yep. to prosecute. So good. Yeah. Um, okay. This question is from Sean Fitzgerald, who is watching us on Facebook. Hi, Sean. Uh, the question is, do you see any way to get real journalists back into local political settings, uh, board of education meetings, zoning boards, et cetera, when the spread of free neighbor pages uh, that call, that provide rumors and misinformation continue? God, I hope so, Sean. Right. Ne next door is the enemy of, 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 uh, of everything. Um, look, look, I mean, I, I think that the hollowing out of the local media is a real problem in exactly the way you just described. You specifically called out school boards. Think about where the the battle is being waged right now in public education in, in these school board meetings, whether it's critical race theory ban or the mask. policing of books in libraries or the mass conversation. Um, and who's watching this? I mean, that's the problem is that the local news organizations don't have the resources, human or financial, to be a sufficient check on this. Yeah. So this to me just gives more evidence of why it's critical that our local news organizations get help and support and strengthened. And if they, the existing ones can't do it, we got to stand up new ones in the position of being able to, to report on this stuff. Um, yeah. You know, the, 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 the part that I find most uh, troubling is that the the decline in the media has left whole state agencies in Texas just totally uncovered, just yeah. totally uncovered. No one is watching X agency. And I just think, no, I mean, that's that is the moment when there are no reporters there that the people in charge exit the back door of the building with a washing machine strapped to their hips. I mean, I, I th this is how you don't check corruption sufficiently. Absolutely. You don't hold people accountable is by saying, well, we don't really have any reporters anymore because the hedge fund that owns us told us we had to cut our budget. Right. Right. You know, or how people get how we get caught flat footed on, you know, things that have been building, building, building at the local level. And yet, you know, we we, we didn't see those things coming and then they bubble up to the surface, uh, you know, at, at election time. And, and, and uh, you know, we're surprised and, and I don't ever want to be caught. Flat -footed, but that is really why local journalism matters. I will tell you, one of the things I miss most uh, on a campaign trail is being able to go 
drop into a city as a national uh, politics reporter to right. look at the editorial page, read letters to the editor, you know, from some uh, paper in <clears throat> Des Moines or, or, you know, somewhere in Ohio or somewhere in South Carolina and to see what it is that that community is thinking and feeling and talking about uh, in terms of what the issues are and what it is that they really care about. When and there's no substitute for a person who's been a local reporter in a community for a long time and knows the players and knows the game. And I'm sorry, the national political newsletter is showing up in everybody's hometown no. to do some kind of flyover deal every morning is not going to do the trick. We have no. some of those here. The people who are doing them are good people. They're good journalists. I read them. But at the end of the day, what we're missing is missing. It's yeah. not being it's not being substituted for no. and there is no there is no substitute for it. There really is not. Uh, and, and I certainly echo that as a former state house reporter. Um, th there is no substitute for that. And that is something um, that, uh, again, that, that just is another way in which we continue to make the case for local journalism, because the people that are covering local politics and state politics yeah. are the ones that are really informing us about where this democracy is, because so much of what is happening is happening across the country. But to see it happening right. in place after place um, really kind of helps give us the building blocks to talk may, about. May I make one observation just about the state of Texas, which I find so fascinating. Yeah. The last time a Democrat was elected statewide in Texas was 1994, mm. 28 years ago. I have people at the Tribune in important jobs who were literally not alive. Yeah. For people at our news organization, in some cases, anybody below the age of 28, that's like Lincoln striding the earth. That's like straight from the history books. And the problem is that the hollowing out of the journalism industry in local communities has often meant that the institutional memory in a news organization is in the head of somebody who's 26. And I worry a little bit about what we're losing, just the historical perspective on how the thing that just happened is not the worst thing ever because this has happened before. Or, yes. you know, the, the idea that only one party is going to rule a state. Well, there was a time. Yes. Some of us were alive when that wasn't the case. Like. I which is also why the, the, the war on history is so dangerous, right? Like we understand none of this is happening in a vacuum. Most of this stuff is not new because most of this comes from a playbook that has worked uh, yeah. over previous political cycles. And so they're, you know, re-upping it and do, people who are older than those folks uh, and old enough to remember when this stuff did work and know that it could work again uh, because they're seeing the climate and they're seeing certain things come back around. Right. If we're not putting this stuff into historical context, we are doing a disservice to to our audience uh, of of all ages, but particularly for folks who were not here uh, when those kinds of things were happening. When when uh, you know we had seen some of this before, and we're not you know so before people are too quick to jump to saying, "Oh, this is the worst it's ever been." It's like actually, <laughs> no. Let me tell you about you know. Story. Right. Yeah. Right. You know what I mean. So, um, okay, Jim Schachter, who was also watching on Facebook from New Hampshire. Hello. Love the Granite State. Uh, love, uh, can't wait to be back out there in just a couple of years already. Uh, Jim wants to know how we build a constituency for quality news. I think I probably know some of what you're going to say, but I'll. Well, well, I mean, I think the way you, you, you build a constituency is by providing quality news. And then ultimately you hope that you train people's consumption habits to. Uh, yes. To, to have them not only expect it, but to demand it. Um, you know, I think I said earlier, there's no problem in journalism that is not solved by more and better journalism. And I think that as long as we do the highest quality work on a consistent basis and give people something to look forward to, to expect, and ultimately to demand, you build the market. It's no, it's, it's no different than any product that you invent and sell. You get people hooked on it. And you build a constituency for it. Yeah, yeah. No, I absolutely agree with you. But I, you know, I, I would also, uh, I would also just say uh, to Jim, you know, we are all in this together. Uh, we are. You know, if if there, uh, you know, if there is quality news that you believe in, support it, share right. it, right. tell people about it. Um, and 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 I think that that you know, people aren't necessarily listening to me on MSNBC. Uh, that they're not going to. You know, if somebody's not inclined to listen to me on there talking about a story that, that I've done on the 19th, but it takes somebody uh, that somebody trusts to share my story with them that might make them read what it is that I'm trying to say. Like uh, community members and trusted messengers are among our greatest allies in yep. in this experiment uh, that, that in, in, in this profession that we are 
that, that we love so much, but really that, that we cannot pull off without, without all of you. So um, thank you for believing in quality news and wanting to share quality news and, and wanting to support quality news. Uh, okay, we've got one more from Elizabeth Kokorin, who is also watching on Facebook, uh, okay. who thanks for our time. So thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, would you both comment on whether there are enough business development people in journalism? In other words, do our journalistic organizations have enough business people to develop the multiple lines of revenue? Uh, I think the answer is no. I think it's a very sophisticated question because I think when, when people have an idea to start an organization like the one that we started or the one that you all started at the 19th, the assumption is let's get a whole bunch of journalists together and let's go. Yeah. But, you know, there's a back of house part of that. Yes. You yes. know, you, you, you have an operation that you have to stand up and run successfully. And uh, you can't undervalue the contributions of those folks. I happen to know some of the business people of the 19th. And I know that your success is their success and their success is your success every bit as much as the journalism. Absolutely. And I know in the case of the Tribune, the same. We have only survived as long as we have and been as successful as we have because we had sound people raising money, sound people providing financial reporting and accounting, people doing human resources work, people doing technology work that nobody in the public see. I mean, I, I think that we have to we have to invest in that part of the business for sure. Yes. And and being at a startup and 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 starting small, we've 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 grown tenfold over these past couple of years, but just being able to see the many different parts of this organization yeah. that go into the finished product that people see when they go to 19thnews.org. I mean, sure, that that's one thing, but but really knowing uh, and seeing those folks behind the scenes, I'm grateful for every single person that makes the 19th possible every single day because it is not just us in the newsroom. It is it is the entire organization that pulls us whole, off. Whole, whole place, day. whole effort. Everybody yes. pitches in. That's right. Absolutely. Okay. So wait, no, we got one more question that I think is is uh, is a good one. This is from Marty Fishoff, who is also joining us on Facebook. Hi, Marty. <coughs> Marty, yep. so how serious a threat to reporting the news is the Sarah Palin suit against the New York Times? I make a, a point of not answering questions I don't have an answer to. And in that case, Aaron, I'm following along with everybody else. My I am old, too. I my was really college mad. mate, Eric Wemple of the Washington Post, has been doing great reporting on that. And I'm following along Eric's coverage of it. But um, I don't feel like I can say one way or the other yet, except I'm fascinated to see how the whole thing turns yes. out. I think I think we're all in kind of wait and see mode. I mean, the fact that she was on the sand today, I, I'm, I'm fascinated by all of this and we'll be. Oh, I know. I know. I can't see, wait to see more about that. Right. What what this means for our profession uh, and, and 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 uh, just really the conversation that it sparks and and uh, and where where things could possibly go from here as a result of, of this particular case. Well, I mean, time flies when we are talking about trailblazing and 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 making history and legacy. So, uh, look, I mean, I just want to say, Evan, you are the definition of a living legend in our profession. We are better for you having passed our way, my brother, uh, because really what you and your colleagues have built has been a model for so many of us. I know that you'll never be far from those of us who will be still planning to call on you from time to time. So, you know, pick up the phone when we call you. Uh, but in the meantime, thank you so much for taking on this assignment. Thank you so much for your vision. Thank you so much for your leadership. Best wishes to you as you head into the great unknown. And please, please, please do not be a stranger. Uh, I won't be. And, and let me say how much I appreciate the opportunity to spend any time at all with you, even virtually. I'm getting tired of virtual. I can't wait for it to be me in person. Too. But, but, you, but you and yours make me feel like there's a future out there and a hope for the future that um, al allows me to to sleep at night. So Aaron, thank you. And thank you to all of your fellow founding mothers at the 19th for doing the work that you do. You got it. Celebratory barbecue very soon, my very friend. Very soon, I promise. Okay. Thank you so much, everybody. Take care and stay safe.